thank you very much. Um, please enjoy the talk, everyone. Thank you, Harry. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, here today. Uh, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to be with all of you, and I I wish I was there in person. Uh, but the the nice part, of course, about um, being over Zoom is that I have friends and colleagues and um, even family joining us. Uh, what is this morning for me and in late afternoon or evening for many of you. Uh, so joining from all over um, the place. And so that's really um, a really lovely benefit from being able to do this uh, remotely. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is what it's like to uh, grow up in a Paleolithic society, in a prehistoric society. In, Prehistoric societies, it's estimated that children comprised approximately 40 to 65% of the population. And yet, even though they represent a good portion of the people we're interested in as archaeologists, when we imagine our ancestral landscapes uh, as archaeologists or just as individuals, we tend to imagine them as being peopled by adults who hunt, who gather plants, who fish, um, make stone tools, and create art. And yeah. we know at the same time that the these adults were also, uh, they were parents, they were grandparents, aunts and uncles, uh, to the children who must have been all around them. And I use those terms, parents, grandparents, with, with quotes around them, because of course, we don't know exactly what relationships people in the Paleolithic would have recognized, and we don't know how they would have codified them and so on. But those things must have existed to some in some fashion or another. And so these adults then had to make space physically, emotionally, uh, intellectually and cognitively for the children around them. And yet the contributions of those children in terms of economics and, and social roles and political roles have really been until recently uh, understudied. And so what I'd like to do this morning is to divide my talk into three different parts. The first part is to look at why children were understudied. Uh, and then to look more closely at the kinds of evidence we have for their, uh, for their contributions in the past. And then finally, to, to sort of bring it all together, I'd like to talk about why we should be studying them. So first of all, why are kids understudied in the archeological record? So this is not a problem that's unique to my time period uh, that I study of the Paleolithic. Uh, so a period beginning somewhere or ending somewhere around 10,000 years ago and stretching all the way back to about 3.4 million years ago when we have the first uh, recognizable stone tools. So as I say, this problem of underrepresentation of children uh, in the archeological literature is something that's more pervasive. It's something shared by all archeologists. And I think there are a number of different reasons. So the first one has to do with differential preservation. The number of children that we excavate is not the same as the number of children in the living population. And the reason for that uh, is that all things being equal, larger, denser bones tend to preserve longer and in better condition in the archaeological record so than, than smaller, lighter ones. So we can think, you know, an extreme example of an elephant versus a bird bone, for instance. And children's bones, of course, are smaller, they're more porous, they're less mineralized, they lack tensile and compressive strength, and often the ends of their long bones um, are not fused. And so all of this leads them to be particularly vulnerable to sedimentary pressure, uh, to bioerosion through contact with acidic soil and uh, decomposing organic matter. And of course, there's, they're also vulnerable to what we call excavator bias. And what I mean by that is that often when archaeologists are excavating, it can be very easy 
to um, overlook a tiny deciduous tooth. And it makes me think of, uh, for a couple of summers, I had the privilege of working at the site of Drimelin, um, just north of Johannesburg in South Africa. And it's, and it's an amazing site um, dating between two and 1.4 million years ago with more than 100, uh, foss 140 fossils of uh, early hominins. So uh, Paranthropus robustus and early homo and including a lot of uh, immature specimens. And I think one of the reasons why the excavators there are finding so many of these immature specimens is that they have a very, um, meticulous program for uh, screening and looking for these really tiny, tiny uh, bones and teeth. And in fact, that's how I spent most of those two summers was uh, looking through microfauna. So just kind of sorting basically through rat femurs, uh, which are super cute, <laughs> looking for tiny deciduous uh, teeth because they're so uh, easy to, to, be, to miss. Children are also underrepresented in the fossil or burial record because they're often subjected to different mortuary practices. So sometimes kids are buried in more remote locations, in shallower graves. Uh, there can be an absence of grave markers or they're not placed in coffins. Uh, there's no internment at all, or there's uh, internment in a um, different kind of burial container like a jar, for instance. And, Often it has to do with um, uh, children's uh, personhood or how we what, how we view children, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't. It doesn't indicate necessarily a lack of, of of love or care for these children by any means. It's just they can they can have be treated differently, and that can lead to again an underrepresentation of them. A second reason is that sometimes children as holotypes of biological evolution are considered problematic and of limited inferential significance. So when a new specimen or new species is being published, uh, scientists will choose a holotype, a single specimen, upon which the description and the name of that new species is based. And we can think about, as a great example, the publication of the Tong child uh, as the holotype of the Af Australopithecus africanus um, uh, with, by Raymond Dart. And one of the criticisms, I mean, they launched a lot of criticisms at, at Raymond Dart Pull, you know, he was public, he was coming from the wrong part of the world. He, you know, mixed his Greek and his Latin. Uh, but one of the more substantial arguments uh, was uh, that we don't know what this child will look like when it gets older. So perhaps this um, new species, this representative of a new, of a new species looks sort of human-like when it's little, but maybe when it grows up, it will be much more ape-like. A third, um, a third reason that children have been understudied in the archaeological record is this perception that children distort the archaeological record. And this is um, a friend and colleague of mine and someone who's a pioneer in uh, the archaeology of children, Jane Baxter, has written a lot about this. And so she's said that that this perception that children's play is random and unpredictable uh, has really sort of uh, delayed our, our studies or, or set back our studies of them. And the argument is, is that children aren't, aren't only unknown, but they are unknowable. And so they're often used uh, as cautionary tales for archeologists. So people will write about, uh, oh, you, you think that finding this knife in the, in the backyard is, you know, this is a stupid example, but is, you know, has some sort of behavioral significance, but aha, it's just a child who moved it, you know? So therefore here's a cautionary tale. We can't take uh, an object out of place, for instance, uh, at, at, you know, meaning as behaviorally meaningful uh, if it's just the result of random children's play. Uh, but how I would counter that or my, or my argument to that is that children simply add to the life history of an object. If we think of any object as having a life history, as having um, a biography, then children 
repurposing this, uh, these objects is just adding to that biography. And as archaeologists, we should be asking the same types of questions that we would of any other object or any other individual. So children are only distortions of the archaeological record. If we think we should only be reconstructing adult behavior rather than human behavior uh, more broadly. And the image that I have here um, is of children wearing flip-flops with uh, faux, uh, faux animal prints. And I love the idea that you would be able to find um, perhaps deer footprints on the beach. <laughs> and, and in fact, it's actually just um, children's sandals. I wish they came in, in, adult, um, in adult sizes. <laughs> okay, moving on. So the fourth reason why kids are understudied in the archaeological record is that Again, we have this perception or an assumption um, of children's lack of agency. And I think a lot of the work that we're doing in the archeology span of children now really challenges these expectations of children and childhood. When I teach a class on the archeology span of children, I start every, every year, I start with the question to my students, what are some words uh, or phrases that you think of when you think about children and you think about childhood. And they always come up with the same sorts of, of phrases and words they talk about. Um, uh, they, they, they say they're, they're naive, they're um, playful, they're happy, they're, you know, any number of different words. And I don't know whether this describes their own childhood or you know, a nostalgia for it, or a nostalgia for uh, an idealized childhood and so on. But the kinds of things that we then go on to look at in, in the class are never the things that we, we um, that they bring up. We don't, they never talk about children's contributions as, as social activists, as, as being politically active, being um, these econ, uh, these contributors to the economy or the spiritual well-being of the communities uh, of which they are a part. And I think a lot of this is really framed by a Western uh, 21st century idea of what children do and what they're capable of. And in fact, that's never this sort of idea that children only play, and I'm gonna put that in quotes because I think play is really an important way of learning, um, but this idea that they only play and they don't contribute in any way um, is not true now and it's never been true. And Kathy Camp, another pioneer in the archeology span of children, um, put a whole list together of the different kinds of things that children around the world engage in, including herding, fetching water, harvesting vegetables, collecting firewood, tending animals, cleaning and sweeping, uh, caring for younger siblings, and of course, um, uh, working in, in markets, working in factories, I mean, working as, unfortunately, as, as soldiers, all sorts of, of things that children uh, do. And that really challenges our expectations of them and this idea that children lack agency. So I wouldn't say that they're fully autonomous, but children are definitely not fully constrained either. And then finally, the last reason that I think kids are understudied in the archeological record is that I think that children as a research topic are somewhat, have, have been marginalized. And it's very similar to the bias that we've had in archeology span for decades, but which has really changed over the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years, um, where we have a bias, where we used to have a bias towards men in archeological interpretations. So if I um, put together, um, if I ask people, you know, who, who makes cave art or what, give me an idea of what a, what a cave artist might have looked like, um, quite often people will still have an idea of, of a male in mind. And that's sort of our default category. And it's not to say that men were not doing art or making tools or whatever, but that tends to be our default category that we never challenge. And so because of the archeology, span the rise of the archeology span of gender and feminist archeology span focusing on women, 
This has by extension led to a focus on children. And I'm thinking of some of the early pioneering work by people like Meg Conkey, Ruth Tringham, Rosemary Joyce, Janet Spector, and many, many other um, people who have come before me that, that I'm um, privileged to, to build upon. And then, of course, when we're talking about the archaeology of children, Jane Baxter, Kathy Camp, Tracy Ardern, and many, many others have really sort of pushed the boundaries of the kinds of questions that we ask. Um, and so it's all part of a larger movement in archaeology of diversifying voices, of looking for multiple genders, looking at different ages, although I would argue that um, the elderly are still understudied in our, in our um, reconstructions of the past. Um, but looking also looking at multiple ethnicities and the construction of identity, um, the intersectionality of, of a lot of these different variables, uh, multiple sexualities and so on and so forth. And um, a few years ago, Meg Conkey wrote an article uh, titled something like, is there a gender of theory? And she looked at who is getting published when they write about archeological theory and who is getting reproduced in or what papers are being reproduced in readers or collected volumes on the archaeological on archaeological theory and she found that at least until fairly recently research conducted by women or, or papers published on theory by women tended to be reproduced in these edited volumes if they focused on gender or more rarely if they focus on children. And so they are very easy to compartmentalize and to ignore if you wanted to. And so I think that's really been part of this, that most of the work on children has been done uh, theoretical as well as practical um, or case studies have been conducted by women. Now this is changing dramatically and in my field I can think of uh, Felix Reed and, and Anders Hogberg and many others uh, who are contributing uh, to this a great deal. But I think traditionally it has been primarily women. And I think that may be one of the reasons why um, there has been uh, a delay to make this more mainstream. But I'm happy to say that's all changing now. Uh, so now that we've looked at why children have been traditionally understudied in the archaeological record, I would like to move to looking at the nature of the evidence. And I'm going to really focus on the archaeological evidence for the contribution um, and lives of children in the past, but I'm going to just very briefly talk about some biological perspectives and so or biological lines of evidence. So we have a lot of life history data. We can, uh, and this is very important and something I'm going to come back to at the end of my talk. But what we do know from looking at um, fossils and from doing comparative biology and so on is that we know that humans mature much more slowly than other primates. And that throughout our evolutionary history, we have seen the insertion uh, and the expansion of child of two life history stages, childhood and adolescence, uh, compared to what we see with non-human primates. And why this is important is that we know that there has been a selection for social learning and that the expansion of childhood and adolescence over time has allowed for additional years for children and, and later teens to be able to learn from their environment, from their peers, from the adults around them. And we also have an increase in longevity more broadly that allows us not only this time, this opportunity for learning, but also the opportunity to apply this learning. And I think that's incredibly important. So we see that the expansion of, of this, these years of, of growth and development um, are really key for who we're going to be as adults. We can also look more broadly at growth and development studies. Uh, we can look at uh, breastfeeding and the onset of weaning, even with Neanderthals, for instance, and earlier species. And then we can draw on non-human primate models to look at uh, 
evidence for cooperative breeding, allo par parenting, the evolution of infant care, all sorts of things like that. Um, the addition of ancient DNA has been revolutionary in terms of being able to help us sex immature specimens, which are very, that's very difficult to do. And so all of a sudden we can start to be able to put together um, what was life like for uh, a male, female um, at, uh, um, although I recognize that that binary is um, problematic, obviously, um, but start to be able to look at the intersection between age and sex. We can look at isotopic data for diet. And then, as I say, there's these revolutionary uh, techniques for aging and sexing specimens. But I'd really like to focus on the archaeological evidence for children in the Paleolithic. And one of the best ways to see children is actually to see them, is actually to look at images of them. We don't have very many, and we don't have many that are not controversial. But to give you an example here, we have some evidence of uh, images of children in terms of figurines and paintings and engravings. So from the site of La, La Marche in France, uh, we have a plaquette, which is uh, basically a thin thin uh, piece of rock uh, that uh, from about 14,000 years ago with five engravings of heads of possible uh, infants and children. And the reason why people have argued these may be um, images of children is the ratio of the, um, the eyes to the overall face and so on. The proportions of the face look childlike or infant-like. We have another example of a Magdalenian site of Gornersdorf in Germany, uh, where we have uh, stylized, what are thought to be uh, images, very stylized images of women. And there's a really tiny one in between uh, that looks like it might be connected to the back of one of these women. And so people have suggested because of the size and those lines possibly connecting them, uh, that this might be a child in a back carrier um, in some fashion. And then we have a number of figurines from uh, the site of Malta in Siberia. And this one here is interpreted as a child, perhaps wearing overalls. And again, it's uh, to do with the overall proportions that have suggested to people that they that this might be a child. And we have um, uh, ones that are suggested to be teens as well. We also have, uh, again, in a very direct visceral way of being able to see children is through their handprints and their footprints. Um, in terms of footprints, we have literally thousands of foot Paleolithic footprints, and many of them belong to uh, subadults that belong to children and teens. And one of the benefits when we come back to that idea of maybe children's play being random, um, I wouldn't necessarily use the word random here, but I would say that children will often play in unexpected places. And that's an actual benefit for us because children's footprints will often not be obliterated the way adults ones will because they are playing in somewhere unexpected, in, in, in somewhere less traveled. Um, and so they're often preserved. And we can see by looking at these footprints, we can get a lot of information about height, about weight, about how fast they're walking or running, whether they're carrying something, whether they're in the company of others. And we have some examples uh, from the site of Neo, for instance, where we have children who seem to be playfully making footprints, making them, the, you know, the absolute perfect footprint in the mud, the way you would um, at the beach, for instance, if you wanted to make a perfect footprint in, um, in, wet, in wet sand. And we have other evidence of kids running around and throwing clay pellets at each other and so on. Um, and so we get this wealth of, of information. We can also see um, from in terms of who they're with, uh, we can get an idea of, of task groups and so on. So not just play, but also uh, work, exploration, all sorts of things like that. And then we have a variety of, of handprints um, in Paleolithic cave art uh, from infants uh, all the way to older children. Um, and so again, 
this helps us to see that children were at least in some ways partaking in the creation of art, that they were, uh, they were witnessing it, they were involved, somehow space was being made for them. And that really challenges our ideas of who uh, is making, uh, making cave art, for instance. So children are contributing to this in many ways. We also have uh, fingerprints on, on clay. Um, we have dental imprints on, on resin, uh, almost like a chewing gum, but for making, for helping to make composite stone tools. So there's lots of different ways that we can look for imprints of children and get a lot of information about what they were up to. Again, uh, another line of evidence is that we have uh, burials. And this has traditionally been where we have focused in the archaeological record on looking at children because uh, we have their bones, right? We have their remains. We know we're looking at a child and we know that if we're looking at grave goods associated with that child that we can make some direct connections between them. Um, but my but friends of mine or colleagues of mine have argued that sometimes by focusing on burials and not just in the Paleolithic, but more broadly in the archeology span of children, we're often, often focusing on the dead, dead child rather than the living dead child. So in other words, we're looking at the deaths of these kids rather than looking to their lives. But I think that this is actually, um, the questions we're asking are becoming a lot broader now. And we are trying to, to again, really look at, at the lives of these, of these kids more broadly. So just a few examples of some burials here. Uh, we have the three uh, teenagers buried together at Dolne Vestinici in the Czech Republic from about 25,000 years ago. I don't have time to go into all the um, bizarre drama that I think is being played out in this it, it, here, but I, I absolutely love this one. We have often during this, um, around this time period of, of the Gravenian, around 25,000 years ago, we have, we have some triple burials where we have two individuals engaging and a third one who seems to be um, on, on the outs a little bit, who's disengaged. Uh, in this particular uh, thing we see three individual three males here um, and associated with a variety of uh, of tools and, and 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 copious amounts of ochre and so on and some sort of human drama has played out so that these three teens um, have been buried uh, together in but but also displayed in a in, in a very specific way with the um, arm of one reaching out to the pelvis of the other, for instance, and one looking away and so on. We have uh, twins buried together around 31,000 years ago in Austria. Um, and this is another incredible uh, burial where we have, uh, again, we know from ADNA that we have two males here. Uh, so the same three, three males at Dolne Vesnici, two males here. Uh, in Krems Watchburg. And um, here we have these twins. We used to think, we knew that they, we thought they were twins um, originally because they, they, you know, based on aging of, uh, of their femurs and so on. Uh, but now we know that for sure. One child died um, not too long after birth and his brother then died about about close to two months later. So the burial was reopened and space was made for the second little one to be um, buried with his brother. And we see that these um, children are buried with um, uh, mammoth ivory beads and with copious amounts of, of ochre. Um, there is also another burial nearby of someone who, another male who is thought to be perhaps a cousin to these individuals. And this one seems to be wrapped in a shroud because he's also covered with ochre, but it's more delimited. Uh, and so they think that he was probably wrapped in a shroud. And that's why that ochre, um, as I say, is, is quite more um, restricted in its distribution. We have a 17 year old male with dwarfism from Italy um, buried in his mother's arms about 12,000 years ago. This is one of my favorite burials the, the, from Romito in, in Italy. Um, this one I love because this individual is not, it's not a rich burial. It's not, it's not full of, of you know, these, these 
tons of beads or anything like that. But what I love is that even though this individual would have had trouble keeping up with his peers, um, he was able to, uh, you know, in, in a hunting party, he was eating the same kind of meat rich diet that everyone else was. We know that from a study of his bones. And when he died, he was wrapped in his, what we, an older woman's arms. We think based on morphology that this was his mother. Uh, we don't know for sure, but it's quite likely. And what I like about that is that it was the community that decided to place the bodies that way. It was the community that, that, that wrapped the arms around the other. And so it was that community who, who cared for this individual throughout his life and then who recognized the importance of these relationships. And there was, between him and this other other individual, um, and that there was an idea that this might continue beyond um, beyond their deaths. And then my final example is um, a child from the site of La Madeleine, uh, who is associated with just copious amounts of very standardized beads. Um, I have a reconstruction here of the child. We don't actually know this was a girl, um, but we have artistic license. Uh, and this is, a, and you're seeing in this clothing how the, um, how these beads might have looked. And so what's very interesting is that they're very standardized and shows wear on them. So we know that the, these were beads that were worn during life. And what I also love about them and we see not only in this example, but in others as well, is that um, the, um, the beads are smaller than what we would see associated with adults. And so it's not as if these beads are being recycled from adults and just used for kids, but they're actually being made specifically for children. And we see that at a number of different, uh, at different sites. And to put all of the, hundreds of hours it would have taken to collect these shells, to, to standardize them, to create the beads, to embroider them and so on, to take all of those hours of work and put them in a burial to remove them to, from circulation speaks to really the great care um, and I would say affection uh, that um, the community had for this little one uh, when he or she um, died. Another line of evidence we have uh, is toys, perhaps. Um, this is a bit more controversial. Some people have talked about figurines being uh, possible toys. And it's possible. I mean, there's the great example here of the, the lion man. But um, my feeling about this is that Upper Paleolithic figurines are so varied and found in so many different contexts in so many different kinds of materials that it's likely that there's not one explanation for all of these figurines. And so I'm quite comfortable suggesting that perhaps that some of them may have been toys. I wouldn't say all of them by any means. But then we also have other examples of clay pellets that have been thrown at each other, um, possible whistles, we have tiny weapons, so small hand axes, for instance, or small spears. And then we also have what's known as uh, a, thoma a thomatrope um, from uh, this example is from Loche Bass in France. Um, but these are basically, if any of you have had as kids flip books uh, where you have um, a picture drawn along the side of your book and as you flip through it, um, it looks as if that that drawing is moving. So um, I remember having one that I gave one of my children where there was someone fishing. And then as you flip the book quickly, um, it looked as if um, the tiny fish that the fisherman was reeling in, uh, you know, he's reeling in this tiny fish and then a giant fish jumps out or a whale jumps out and, and, uh, and devours both the uh, fisherman and the tiny fish that he thought he was reeling in. And so because of retinal persistence, as we flip through these pages, these, these tiny changes in the drawing make it animated. It makes it look as if we're watching a small, uh, a small film. And so these objects, these Paleolithic thomatropes um, 
act in the same way. So what you're looking at here is uh, two sides of the same artifact and with a, a deer on either side. And there's a hole through it. And when you when you thread some cord through it and you and depending on how quickly you move that cord back and forth, it will um, it flips back and forth. And again, because of retinal persistence, the images stay there and it looks as if um, this deer is moving. A colleague of mine, uh, Mark Azema, has argued that perhaps this is a dying doe, um, but I, I have argued that I think it's actually a more playful, more cheerful subject. I think this is actually a doe uh, springing, and the reason why I think that is because the body of the doe stays at the same plane, but it's the legs that go up and down. And also those ears are pricked forward. Um, I'm not an expert in, <coughs> excuse me, in deer behavior, but um, one of my former students, Holly Cecile, who made this drawing for me, uh, is and has uh, said that that kind of pricking forward of the ear um, is when these animals are in a more playful mood. So it would be sort of the ideal subject for a toy. And this kind of visual play doesn't have to be for children only. I'm sure that it's the kind of thing that we would see uh, that adults would enjoy as well. And um, we see this kind of, we see lots of examples of visual play in both um, portable and um, and in wall art or cave art. Another line of evidence that we have, uh, nature of the evidence here are secret spaces and small places. Um, basically, um, we have some examples of where we have evidence of children in spaces that would be much more difficult for adults to get into. And so one example is from the site of La, La Chimenas in Spain. Um, my colleague, Leslie Van Gelder, who studies children's finger flutings, that's when children are drawing on cave walls with their, or when anyone draws on, on cave walls um, uh, with their fingers uh, in soft sediments on walls ceilings and floors and so on. And um, what we found when we were look when we were in this site in Spain is that there is a very low ledge uh, and that's very difficult. It was very difficult for either of us to actually get into that under that space uh, to get down on the ground and, and under that very low ledge. But that's where there are tiny, tiny um, children's finger flutings. And so children were getting into those spaces. We worked together at another site called Cunalda. There is a place called The Squeeze, <laughs> which, you know, the name says it all. And that's one of the places, if we can ever get back into the field, um, is where we want to look for children's finger flutings, because children are definitely in that cave. Um, and then there are examples of secret spaces. And um, some people have argued that, um, that, for example, the site of Etiol, a Mag Magdalenian site in France, that some of the locations there um, may be children's secret spaces or basically hideouts or forts. And they base it on the fact, the location, it's with just out of sight of, of larger, what we think are contemporary occupation sites. Um, and also the kinds of artifacts that are there. So there are recycled artifacts, um, that, uh, recycled uh, stone tools that look like children are practicing on them. And there's also um, some faunal remains. So um, kids are bringing snacks. And any of you who had a uh, tree fort, I was always jealous <laughs> of people who had those. Uh, so if you had a, a hide hideout or a tree fort or something like that, I'm sure you remember, or even a tent in your backyard, that you remember that snacks were the most important things to have with you. So there are some uh, examples then of sites that people have suggested might be for kids' uses in that way. Um, we can also look at stone tools in terms of skill acquisition and learning a craft, but this is actually equally applicable to creating art, to making ceramics and so on. Um, and we can talk about sort of the situated learning or the social context of, of learning. We know um, from that there are a number of archaeological signatures of novices. So if we look at um, stone tools, for example, we can look for very typical errors of people who are learning to make stone tools. Um, we can look at the location, perhaps um, 
novices are working on a periphery of a site, or perhaps they're working right next to um, an expert napper at the in a more central location. Um, often novices use poor quality raw material. They'll use recycled materials. So they'll take a stone tool that's been discarded and rework it to practice on it. Um, sometimes the strategies they use are a little bit simpler. And often people have talked about um, the size that sometimes uh, smaller people, so children will make smaller sized artifacts. There are all sorts of other reasons that artifacts can be small. So that's, have to do that with, look at that with caution. And then finally, we can look at uh, what's called non-productivity. So some people have argued that stone tools, for instance, that are made by novices, um, some of them anyways are just done for practice and they're left where they're made. They're not taken away to be used. I think that that's you know, I think that's true, and in, in, but not in all cases, because I think that uh, everyone must have learned to make their own stone tools uh, for their basic necessities, their basic day-to-day -day needs. And so that brings up the question, if we can see novices through all these different signatures in the archaeological record, is a novice always a child? And of course, in our own in our own lives, that's not true. I'm taking a, a pottery class, my first one this afternoon, and I will definitely make novice errors. Uh, but I think when we're talking about the Paleolithic, that's a very different sort of thing because making everyone needs, as I said, to make a stone tool to meet their basic needs for um, processing plants, for making cordage, for, uh, you know, hunting for any number of different things. And so maybe not everyone will grow up to be an expert, expert flint napper or stone tool maker, but everyone must learn it, learn the skill. And I think if you're going to learn it, you learn it as in this particular society, I think you will learn this um, as a child. And the same goes with ceramics um, and, and art and so on. It, the age at which you begin will vary. Uh, but I think we can be fairly comfortable in saying that uh, when we see novices, we're looking at children at this time period. And then uh, finally, um, uh, I want to look very briefly what we would call intangible heritage. Uh, so looking at the evidence for children, oral storytelling, and Paleolithic arts. So again, we have evidence of children uh, with clay work, uh, with creating art, so the finger flutings, the handprints. Uh, we even have the evidence of a child creating a, a symbol or a, a tectiform in cave art. And this is uh, work done again by my colleague, Leslie Van Gelder. So this is a, um, a finger fluted um, tectiform, uh, which is, which one of the things I like about this is that it's a smaller one near um, a larger one, uh, and it's done at the height of a child versus the other one, which is done at the height of an adult. And because of the way the lines cross, it looks like the adult one was done first. So I don't want to read too much into it, but it does look as if a child is learning to make these particular signs or symbols. Um, and I think the other thing that we need to look at here very briefly is the importance of oral storytelling in foraging societies. We often, anthropologists have often argued that direct teaching is rare in foraging societies. By direct teaching, I mean the kinds of uh, classroom settings where you have a, you know, where that's more a familiar example to us, where we have a teacher who is imparting knowledge in a very formalized way. Um, but many people have argued that oral storytelling has all of the features or many of the features of direct teaching. And it has the, um, advantage of allowing children to live vicariously through the rich memories and experiences of others. And so I think that um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of narrative quality to Ice Age art. We always say there aren't scenes in Ice Age art, but there actually are. And so I, I've made an argument in, in other publications or in publications that Ice Age art may have been part of a larger oral uh, story uh, history or a story practice, and that uh, we can and and that I think children were very much educated in this way. And I'm going to come back to this idea in in just a moment. 
Uh, again, we've looked at clothing already and the kinds of beadwork and, and so on that's done for children as well. So all of this is part of a more intangible heritage, as we say, uh, compared to say things like, um, like stone tools. So to conclude my talk then, we've looked at why um, children have been understudied. We've looked at at evidence that shows their contribution and and you know attest to their their presence, um, you know the, this rich evidence for uh, apprenticeship and all sorts of things like that uh, in stone tool making. And so the question then, as I conclude, is why should we be studying Paleolithic kids? Well, first of all. Children are an interesting topic in and of themselves, and that could be the, the, the end of the, of the reason for studying them. Uh, Jane Baxter, in a keynote talk that she gave to a conference on the archaeology of children a few years ago in Mexico City, started off by saying, we have to stop apologizing for studying kids. And we all started to laugh because in those of us sitting in the audience, because it was it was so true it rang so true every one of us who gave a talk that day started off with a slide um justifying why we felt we were why we needed to study kids or why we were presenting on kids in a room full of people who study kids so they're an interesting topic in and of themselves beyond that Children, as I say, are a large formed a large part of prehistoric societies. And for 99.83% of our time on this earth, <laughs> to be precise, um, we lived in these sorts of, of we lived in Paleolithic societies in these prehistoric societies. And so if we want to know about our heritage, we need to know more about children. And so that would be enough of a reason. But beyond that, I think we should also be studying Paleolithic kids because of their, their contributions to the evolution of human culture. So very briefly then, infants are born into a community. Um, and when they're born, they, they have all this cultural knowledge that they need to acquire uh, in order to be able to survive and thrive. But as novices in this culture, if I can use that term, it's difficult for them to figure out what behavior was most relevant. And so we, we depend on expert knowledge holders, who are usually adults, to help novices acquire this culturally relevant behavior. But Children are not passive learners. They increasingly choose what and who to learn from. It begins with a vertical uh, knowledge transfer from adult to child to horizontal knowledge transfer where peers become more important to what we call oblique knowledge transfer where teens in particular seek out adults, not necessarily their parents, but other adults that they perceive to be innovators. And Shana Lou Levy and her colleagues um, have done some really path-breaking work uh, working with um, hunter-gatherer children and, um, and adolescents. And in this particular study that they did in 2017, they realized that while adolescents are not necessarily innovators, they preferentially seek out adults they identify as innovators. So these teens are the main recipients and the main transmitters of these innovations, and they often use these innovations to help in search for marriage and sexual partners. And we can think about an example in our own lives, right? Our, those of us who have, uh, have teenagers or younger children, we know that they're usually the one, they're not the innovators, they're not making the, the, the new phones, for instance, or the new apps, but they're the ones that are quickly adopting that. And if you're my age, you remember helping your own parents. I remember helping my parents program their first VCR that they ever bought. But um, now if I need to use an Xbox controller to download Netflix onto my smart TV, I'm calling one of my kids to come and, and help me with that even though I'm comfortable with, uh, with uh, computers and so on, but they are these early adopters and transmitters of these technical innovations. And what's really important in what we call activity theory um, is that this learning and knowledge transmission very often happens through socially organized activities. 
from storytelling uh, to learning stone tools and ceramics and what we call communities of practice. So where um, kids begin sort of on the periphery, often through playing with materials, playing with clay, for instance, and then eventually being brought into the center of these communities of practice where they become expert ceramicists or nappers or, or artisans or whatever. And so this extension of the human life course that we looked at at the beginning of this talk allows for extra years for learning all of these sorts of things in a social setting, and again, the opportunity for using that learning. And the reason why this is important, this sort of uh, what we call situated knowledge, the social knowledge, is that it underlies something that's unique to humans, and that's cumulative culture. And before I introduce that, I have to look at another idea, which is distributed cognition. Distributed cognition is basically the idea of, of shared knowledge. So knowledge that we need, that anyone needs to survive or thrive in a particular niche is beyond the capacity of one mind. And it takes in, instead pooled knowledge of, of, or collective knowledge of many minds augmented over time. And this is what we call cumulative culture. And we can, in an example that I read recently um, of that was uh, a survivor of the 2004 Indonesian tsunami, where that individual uh, talked about how he had never seen a tsunami in his lifetime. I mean, it's a fairly rare event. Uh, and yet he knew exactly what to do because he remembered stories um, about what to do or what people had done in the past during uh, a tsunami. So he had lived vicariously through them as a child. So the kinds of information he learned as a child through storytelling then late, later were allow, allowed him to survive this catastrophe. And one of the most important aspects of, of cumulative culture is what we call the ratchet effect. So scientists often use the metaphor of a ratchet, which is a tool with an angled teeth that engages in such a way that it allows for motion in only one direction. And so that's when we think about cumulative culture. And people have argued that it's most important during childhood, this ratchet effect, because as a child is born, it masters the artifacts and the social practices in existence at that time. And children then, and particularly teens, again, are these just sponges, these, these consumers and ultimate influencers when it comes to cumulative culture. But we have to remember they're not only adopting these new innovations, but they're also moving away um, from things that they, they don't gravitate to, that don't resonate with them for whatever reason. So there's also, to some degree, a winnowing and a loss of certain practices. But it's the children and the teens who are deciding these sorts of things through their choices of, of what to learn and who to learn from and how to spread this information that changes our cumulative culture from one generation to the next. So distributed cognition and the ratcheting of culture then are what makes complex technologies, cultural institutions and symbol systems that characterize human niches possible. So just, um, so then uh, just to sum up, we have culturally knowledgeable individuals transmitting information that's critical to flourishing in a particular niche to culturally naive individuals. So adults helping kids in that sense. Kids are then making active choices within that uh, smorgasbord, if you will, of, of what to learn and who to learn from. Uh, much of that learning takes place within a social context. We have the extension of the human life course um, and also tons of archeological, rich archeological evidence for apprenticeship and so on. Uh, for, the, for this kind of learning. And then through social learning, children then become these ultimate consumers, producers, transmitters, and what we might call influencers or drivers of human cum uh, cumulative culture. And then of course, as I say, this cumulative culture is the foundation of all the things that we think are important and unique to us as humans, these elaborate artifacts, these symbol systems, cultural institutions, morals and belief systems, and technical competencies. So in conclusion then, there are several reasons why children have been understudied. Uh, we looked at a number of them, uh, but far from being invisible, we see there are multiple lines of evidence that document their presence and contribution. Um, evolutionary suggests 
theory suggests that children and adolescents are perhaps the prime drivers of this human cumulative culture. And I'm very happy to say that I feel that not only in the Paleolithic, but in this field of study more broadly, that we've moved away from a simple excavation of children, where we've really focused more on the, on the deaths of children to an enriched archeology span of children where we're really focusing on their lives. Um, and I'm continuing to do this research, including uh, with Dr. Jennifer French, uh, who is here, uh, who's with you at the University of Liverpool. And we've been uh, switching our focus now to focus more on um, Paleolithic uh, teens. And we've had a number of publications coming out uh, on that topic. So that's where some of this research will be going uh, in the future. Thank you so much for your attention today. Thank you. That's very good. Excellent. Um, very enjoyable. Um, so we've got a couple of questions already lined up. Um, I will ask them first and then we'll get to um, anyone that would like to ask a question with us here today themselves. Um, so first from Walter, um, he's asking about the burials that we saw earlier on. Are they... Uh, children of Homo sapiens, or are they Neanderthals? Uh, the examples that I gave there were actually all of uh, Homo sapiens. I just happened to have some nice uh, images that I could use for that. Um, and also, but there are um, burials of Neanderthal children as well. We actually have, and so it's a bit... I mean, all of you know, the, uh, it's a bit controversial. Neanderthal burials are always controversial. Um, but my feeling on that is the reason, one of the reasons why we have so many Neanderthal children all of a sudden compared to say with Homo erectus or other earlier specimen or species is because we do have this transition to, to burial or at least the protection of these remains in some way. And so I would follow um, Paul Pettit and when he says, you know, it's not all, it's not all Neanderthals who bury their their dead but in some some cases and sometimes we have this practice occurring and so and i think that explains why we have um at least in some instances um even neonate oh no i did have a i hadn't no i didn't have in that slide of the burials i had in, the, in that slide of the burials only modern humans but i did have a, one of my first slides was a neanderthal neonate um but so we have you know these sorts of of very fragile bones remaining because something different is happening. So they're either caching them, they're doing something. Um, and then very recently, there was a publication of the one of the children, one of the immature specimens from La Pharisee, um, a Neanderthal. And that to me, <clears throat> excuse me, was a was a just a beautiful um, new study of that site that showed very clearly um, in a true burial, in my opinion, of um, of a, a Neanderthal child. So I don't think that all Neanderthals buried their kids, but um, I think on occasion, we do see that happening. Perfect, that. excellent. <laughs> I guess I could have just said one answer. <laughs> oh, no, no, answer no. To that question. Sorry, I've gone it's way good. long today. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, question from uh, Patricia, saying that when we look into the lives of children or the youth, what ages or what age ranges are we using um, yeah. in that context, considering the modern um, understanding <laughs> of adolescence goes on for much longer than I think even 20 years ago, probably. Um, oh, totally. So, yeah. Yeah. So that is such a good question. Um, and that's really been sort of a, a problem when I was putting my book together, what do I, who do I call an infant? Who do I call a child? Or, you know, how do, how do you do this? Um, and so I realized that there's a difference between sort of say biological markers that we might use and sort of the cultural codification of those biological markers or the, or the way that childhood is conceived um, from one culture to another. And certainly because we're talking about um, people who lived 40,000 or, um, if we're going back to two, three, four, beyond million, um, we're talking about individuals who are, who are not 
modern humans in any sense of that of that word. Um, so it becomes difficult. So what I did in my book was that I, I looked at biological markers uh, based on, on the work of other people. So looking at uh, when we see, for instance, um, the first uh, permanent premolar, or when we see uh, for we see evidence of an adolescent growth spurt, or something like that. So I use those biological markers uh, to make my categories. But I do understand that that doesn't necessarily map on neatly with um, with cultural conceptions of who is a child and who isn't. And I think this is particularly important with teens. So the work that I'm doing with, with Jenny French on teens, uh, we were the first people, to my knowledge anyways, to look at, at teens in the Paleolithic record. And I think one of the reasons for that is because it's so difficult to decide who is it a teen, right? If we can, if we want to talk about children versus adults in a broader sense, that's easier to do. We have, we feel that, you know, we can sort of say, okay, well, this is a kid, um, but when does a teen become an adult? And so we drew um, on the work of other colleagues to look at, uh, you know, to use their definitions of the um, onset of the adolescent growth spurt and to look at other changes uh, to, the, to the skeleton and to the brain and so on to be able to make our, our, um, our categories for that. And in fact, in the, in the paper that we're just about to um, publish, uh, we define adolescence in that case we did it extremely broadly, more broadly than what I did in my book. So we put it all the way back to the age of 10 and carried it to about 25 or so. And that's actually looking at um, uh, WHO uh, recommendations for adolescents and, and so on, um, because we wanted to make sure that everyone in our study, we're looking at Gravettian teens, uh, we, is that we, we captured all of them. But we, we recognize that socially, that it might be that it's not exactly the same thing as being biologically a teen. So when you when you switch, you know, your social age might be well when you've mastered hunting or when you've mastered stone tools or something, you might be considered differently. So they don't map onto each other so so neatly. But I think we have to work with the biological categories we have, and then use that as a basis for hypothesis testing. So that's basically what we did. Here we have adolescence that's going on for, you know, 14, 15 years, but we've then subdivided that into early, middle, and older adolescence and tried to look for patterning in burials and, and things like that to say, are these meaningful social categories as well? Perfect. Excellent. Um, another one in the chat uh, from Nissa. Forgive me if I've butchered your name. Um, asking about the slide that we you presented the toys on. Um, what exactly is a toy in the context of of you know a non um, modern consumerist culture? Um, she's asked. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there were you know tactics for learning about specifics that we don't understand or life training um perhaps sure. you could yeah. um expand on that yeah for sure so there's two aspects to that question first of all how do we know some something or at least i see two aspects to it so how do we know a toy is a toy for instance and i think that's one of the most difficult things is to know is to be able to recognize a toy in the archeological record, particularly the further back we go. Um, if we're looking at Victorian dolls, for instance, it's not so difficult, but if we're going back to the Paleolithic, how do we know something was a toy? Um, and there is a little bit of a leap of faith there sometimes I would argue. Um, and there's actually a museum of play uh, in the US that uh, describes the stick is probably the oldest toy and the most universal. And, you know, and as I say this, I see everyone smiling because <laughs> everyone remembers, you know, using them as swords or, or fishing or whatever. Um, and, but unfortunately, I would not be able to recognize that in the archaeological record. Um, but other objects, we can look at them in terms of their association with kids. We can, in more recent periods, look at uh, images of where kids are, you know, associated uh, with, a, with a particular object or toy. Um, but it does get kind of difficult. But 
for me, I think, so I don't have a problem with the idea that some of those figurines might be toys or the idea of that uh, thaumatrope might be a toy, or at least, you know, there's visual play um, happening there. And again, we have some examples of smaller tools. And I think this comes to the question then, uh, the second part of that question about life learning or life training, um, where do we make that division between, um, you know, a toy and an actual weapon? And I think that that line is blurred. There's been lots of Marlies Lombard, for instance, Lombard, for instance, has done some interesting work in foraging societies, looking at um, hunting tools and how um, a child is given a bigger and bigger one as he or she grows, um, and they and they're learning. They're learning. Um, uh, through stories. So they get all of these story hunting stories and kids are telling her, you know, by the time we, or people tell her, by the time we ever got to actually hunt, we had heard a million stories about how to hunt, where to hunt and all of those sorts of things. Um, so even though they're playing perhaps with these earlier uh, smaller tools, they're learning through play. And I think that's the most important thing. And that's the way that people often use, learn crafts in, in tr more traditional societies as well. When we're talking about ceramics, uh, you know, it's a great example. Clay is so forgiving. You can use it, you know, and reuse it. Um, it's very hard to hurt yourself with that. And you can be, and we have these examples of kids finger holes and clay and so on um, in some of the caves. So it looks like kids were often uh, playing with clay. And we have some examples um, of um, ceramics from the Gravettian where there's uh, what looked to be children's fingerprints on them. So I think there's, so, I think that bias in our modern societies, and I think that they're the gradation between toy and weapon, um, or toy and functional figurine, you know, or whatever, um, is really um, a very much more gradual, much more subtle one, I would say. Excellent. Well, well put. Um, I see you have a question in here, Don, mm. Don Plant. Would you like, I noticed you're also on camera, would you like to ask a question or would you like me to uh, relay? Talk sure, you, like, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I, I had the course. privilege of working on a, um, a dig in, um, in Israel, an early Bronze Age site, and I realized that you're speaking about the Paleolithic. But um, we found uh, what looks like a ceramics factory um, back in 2017, and there was hard evidence of um, mm. fingerprints on the uh, actual, um, some of the jars and, and some of the bowls that, that we found that mm. um, were definitely made by children or young adolescents yeah. because they were so much smaller. And I'm wondering if you can comment on on child labor. I realize that hunter gatherer <laughs> group, yeah. groups would be uh, would. It's a different context. But yeah. have you has child labor been part of your studies at all? Yeah. Um, so I think for sure. So basically, in the work that I'm doing, I'm really trying to 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 emphasize that children are contributing economically. Uh, to their to their larger communities, and we see this when you look at ethnographically in foraging societies. Kids are are doing everything. They're not only providing their own subsistence, but they're often providing subsistence for their younger siblings, for instance, or they're um, selling items in marketplaces and so on. And certainly, we know that kids are making stone tools in the Paleolithic, and we also, as I say, have some limited evidence so far of children making uh, ceramics. So um, it's different in the, Pale in, in the Paleolithic in that we don't tend to until the very, very uh, end and not even, <clears throat> pardon me, have um, vessels. The, the early ceramics in the Paleolithic um, are figurines. They're, you know, zoomorphic, anthropomorphic figurines, and also these kinds of, um, uh, I think they call them pellets. I can't. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so, um, but they're making these sorts of things. So I think they were very much contributing to the overall, um, you know, they were contributing their labor to the well being of their communities. I don't think in these societies that it would be possible for 
you know, large portions of the population to not be doing anything. At the same time, there's lots of examples of kids in foraging societies having a lot of free time as well. So I don't mean to say that, <clears throat> that it was, you know, all work and no play. I really think that there's a lot of combination of these things um, together. I'm actually starting a new project uh, right now on children and um, Paleolithic ceramics with uh, Becky Farbstein, uh, who is an, an, you know, an expert expert uh, in, in, this, in the area of, of ceramics and, um, so we're going to start, we're working together now to look at um, more evidence for novices uh, and experimentation and all sorts of things like that. And so I'm hoping that I'll be able to um, uh, know more about the, the learning process and also, again, this sort of labor contribution of children. Um, um, so, so stay tuned, <laughs> you know, Thank hopefully you. Uh, <laughs> soon. I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. Thank you for your question, it's great. And what an exciting site that you worked on. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Larry, you're next. Oh, great. Rachel, I'm sorry, Rachel, April, <laughs> thank you so much. For... <laughs> that's okay, so many people call me Rachel and that's no really kidding. funny. <laughs> that's very really strange, yeah. That, yeah. That, was, that was such a comprehensive um, case for an archaeology of children. I, you, let's hope you don't have to keep on making this. It just becomes mainstream. Anyway, um, I have a, a question and observation. Um, oh, OK, sorry. I, I lost you for a minute there. I think I, fro my, I froze. You did. <laughs> yeah. The um, <laughs> question is, this, this, the statistic you began with, so an estimated 40 to 65% mm -hmm. of a population was mm -hmm. children in the past. Yeah. You ended with this as well. Is that mm -hmm. coming from the ethnographic record? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's definitely coming from the ethnographic record. Uh, we don't have that same percentage uh, in the in the um, burial record or the fossil yeah. record, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I think that's to be expected, though. There's kind of a winnowing, um, as, as I'm sure you know, of from the living population to to the one that we actually um, who, who gets buried and where, and the one that we excavate, and then the ones that we're able to analyze. So that's why we get a much smaller percentage. Um, Mary Lewis has talked about this, you know, about what the sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, gold standards, should we be finding 25%, <clears throat> excuse me, of kids, sorry, or 10% um, or whatever. Um, and uh, so there's been people looking at, again, the sort of taphonomy of why we we don't see that 40 to 65 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Annie French has a new book on on paleo demographics and uh, where she covers a lot of this as well. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I'll leave the observation behind. You've been talking for a long time. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what it was. A frog in my throat all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your question and nice to see you. Perfect. So we'll take uh, this last question if that's all right with you, April. Have you got time for one for more sure. for perfect sure. um so um andrea has asked about um understanding burials of children with or adolescents with atypical physical features mm -hmm. um i.e a chondroplasia or cleft lip etc um do you know much about studies on them particularly to do with that for sure. Um, so first of all, I would I would say that uh, Eric Trinkhouse in 2018, I think it is, I might have the date wrong, published a fantastic paper looking at sort of the paleopathologies of, of um, from the Paleolithic. And what he found uh, was that there are so many like I don't want to say bizarre because that sounds judgmental, <laughs> but there are so many uh, rare and incredibly rare um, um, afflictions that we can see that these people were suffering from, uh, that, that many of these individuals who end up in the burials are suffering from. Like it's, it's actually quite spectacular. And he has these, you know, um, wonderful statistics on the, you know, what is the probability of finding, you know, this kind of, of uh, evidence of this disease or, or, or this, um, uh, you know, uh, affliction or whatever. Um, and so there are so many, so I guess, let me rephrase this. Uh, 
Particularly when we look at, say, burials from the Gravettian or the Epigravettian, we find a number of the burials, including those of children or, or immature specimens, uh, having some of these, um, what, what we would call these atypical features. So I, I showed dwarfism, but there's also um, with the uh, three individuals from Dolne Bessinici, the, the person in the middle has, uh, you know, all kinds of problems. Um, in fact, it, he was originally sexed as female because there were so many pathologies around the pelvis uh, that um, it was difficult to sex this individual um, uh, just from, from the skeleton. But, there, but that's like true, not just of those couple of examples, but many of the individuals. Then there are also other ones who seem to have died um, a violent death. There are examples of, of um, kids from Grat des, des Enfants, uh, where you have uh, one child that has a, a triangular point in its thoracic vertebrae. So there, so these burials then are not only of, not only contain a high number of individuals with unusual um, pathologies, congenital pathologies, but also individuals um, that may have died violent deaths. And that's led um, archeologists to describe these burials as people who have had bad deaths in some way. And, uh, and I find that really, really interesting. And again, we have to remember that we're only getting a tiny fraction of people when, we, when we're looking at the burial record. Because again, if people are fairly nomadic, we don't have the cemeteries the way we do in more recent periods, we, you know, and there's all sorts of reasons for why we're missing a large portion of the population. Um, so we, we only have like a handful, maybe about a hundred individuals say from the Gravettian um, that are ending up in these burials. So it's, the, everything about them is unusual. And people have talked about how in particular with the double and triple burials, there's some sort of tableau that like they've been displayed in a way, um, as they say, sometimes locking arms, sometimes looking at each other, sometimes, you know, there's, there's some sort of drama or some sort of tableau that's being displayed here, a story that's be, I think that's being on display here that makes them even more remarkable. So, um, so yeah, so there are people like Eric Trinkhouse who have looked at the pathologies specifically, and then other archeologists uh, like Julian Riel Sal Salvatore and all of his colleagues um, who have looked at, um, at these bad deaths. And I know I'm forgetting people's names, but there are a lot of people who have looked at, at this issue uh, in detail. Perfect, thank you. Well, uh, I think that brings a close to the talk. Um, apologies for running over everyone, but I, I think it was, I think it was worth it. Really, wasn't it? To be honest. Well done, um, April. Thank you. Yes, Thank very you good. So much. Thank you for your perfect. Questions. Next week we've got um, John Wilman doing um, a talk on uh, body body modifications in the late Pleistocene. So please uh, cool. sign up. Keep an eye on the Twitter. Um, yeah, get ready for that one. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.